So, good morning. Tomorrow, uh, today, where I am going to explain you how we build and deploy Media Salsa, which is a uh, 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 software as a service we are deploying using Drupal. It's Drupal based. So, I am Julien Pivoto, so I am a Belgian guy. I work for Inuit. We are a quite big uh, open source company in Belgium, the Netherlands, and also in Kiev. So let's start. So does someone know what is MediaMosa? Okay, so MediaMosa is a Drupal-based uh, digital asset management system. So basically, uh, it stores assets, it can transcode videos, and it can manage everything about the metadata around it, so creation data, and it's it where all the metadata you can uh, expect. And it can also manage to do the search inside these metadata. And it's also web service oriented. So basically, MediaMosa is a backend, and then you can plug any front end you want. Uh, for example, we use a lot of Seed Builder stuff, which is another Drupal distribution that can just plug to MediaMosa and uh, and make a YouTube-like uh, website. So Media Salsa is just MediaMosa as a service. Uh, we do not use proprietary code. The code is pulled from GitHub, basically. So it's just MediaMosa as a service, uh, nothing more, nothing less. So what is the infrastructure we are speaking about? So that's only the media salsa infrastructure, but behind that we still have puppet servers and all the basic stuff like mail server, etc. But from media salsa, basically you have the backend application which is PHP, for example, or PHP are based, so it's a Drupal distribution. And then you can have front ends that will speak to it. And then you have all the servers, the web servers, the database servers, uh, which are running MySQL, the solar servers, which do, do the search. By default, uh, MediaMosa doesn't use solar, but you can plug it to it, so you can have all the advantages of solar. And then you have the transcoding servers, which will run FFmpeg to just transcode, transcode the video in the right format. And we have all of that for each environment. And by environment, I mean you have the development environment, the user acceptances uh, environment, and then you have the production environments. We have several production environments, so a commercial one, an academic one, and then we can make dedicated environments for some special customers that wants more security or things like that. So each time we are, we duplicate all that infrastructure for one of environment. And each environment is the same. I, I mean, the development environment is the same as the UAT environment and the production environments, which means that uh, if we have performance issues on one of the environments, we will have the same performances on the other environments. So what is DevOps about? I mean, if you are in the DevOps track, track, you might probably know, but DevOps is about four things. It's about cultural changes, automation measurement, and sharing. So uh, we will go one step by one step inside this to see how we implemented the project. The project is uh, only one year and maybe six months old, so let's see where we are at the moment. So Inuit, we are an open, an open source company. We do only open source things. And as it's open source, we contribute back. We do not keep, uh, we do not keep source code for us. We just contribute back to the community. Uh, for example, uh, we publish pipette modules, we publish uh, the media Mosa code and things like that. So we are 40 people in three countries, so Belgium, the Netherlands, and Kiev. Uh, we have customers all around the world, so in France, in the US, and etc. And we, is, we have one language for all the company. This is important because you know, when, when you have a developer that can speak English, it's like, okay, you can communicate with it directly, you need someone more. So, it's important that we have only one language in the company. 
And then what do we do? We do a lot of different things. As we are just, um, we are not a Drupal shop. We do consulting internal project about development, system administration. So we do long term uh, contracts. We do fixed price contracts, and we do a lot of stuff. So that's why, uh, that's why we we are, we are more than just Drupalers. We do a lot of stuff. And then we deal with the ideal worlds, which you have plenty of time, plenty of re human resources, plenty of money, and there is the reality, there is a budget. So you need to take the pragmatic approach. You need to make it just working, and you don't want to deal with someone doing something that you know in two months you will need to do the opposite. So you need to do it right in the first time. So we are a distributed team, which means that we don't have meetings, physical meetings, we don't sit in the same room. We, it's just the communication is very difficult. It's not software, it's not development, it's not fixed. Yeah, you need to talk with people. So how can you improve the communication stuff? There are several areas of improvement. For example, we do daily virtual stand-ups. It can be over XMPP or over Hangouts, so you can actually see each other in the eyes and just talk freely. Then you have Redmine. So everything is a task. And Redmine manage the tasks, the Git repositories, and the documentation. So one project has one Redmine repository. Or one Puppet modules have one Redmine pro project, and like that. And you, we also have mailman. So when you ask a question to the developers, you just send to developers at blah blah dot and you reach everyone that needs to be reached. And then you can also communicate with your tools. Jenkins, uh, you can use XMPP, mail, mailing list, and things like that. So when something happens, everyone knows. And then there is also internal training. You can do them also physically, like, okay, let's all meet in Belgium next week, or you can also do it over Hangout. And you can also have external people just uh, joining for the, this training. And then there is mainly two teams, the developers and the operational team. So the developers are paid to develop new features, to write tests, and the operation guide just take care of the infrastructure and the continuous de delivery integration and all the other stuff. And uh, I could also have the monitoring. And so the ops teach the developers to think about monitoring when they develop uh, their application and think about distributed services or how will it be deployed and will it scale and things like that. And the developers just teach the, top, the ops about Okay, what do I need? What do I need for my test? What will I need for environment? What will be important? And that's a continual process of the developers telling the, oper the operational team, okay, what do I know? What do I need? And the operational just saying to them, okay, we have a performance issue there, so please correct your code or please do something or tell me what I can do to help you. And that's every day communication between all the teams. So that's the cultural things. We still have a lot of things to do inside our teams to get it really done really right. But yeah, we are working on it and it works, it works quite nicely for the moment. Then we have the automation. So the goal of the automation is just you automate all the things. You should not SSH to a server, ideally, in the ideal world. Because if you do SSH to a server, you will probably need to SSH to a server in UAT, in development, in production one, in production two, in production, and then you never end to do manual changes. And when someone figures out, oh, why does it work on that environment and not on that other environment, it's like, oh, but someone made a manual change there. Why? 
why do you need to do manual changes? And when you need to act on a, ser on a server, for example, for maintenance or things like that, you can use tools like mCollective, and then you can say, on older transcoding servers, I want to update that package, or it's really, if you need to, to do it at scale, use just mCollective instead of SSH server. And mCollective is the tool that is used for continuous integration and delivery, so. So we do continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So basically, we do the same for the Puppet code and the application code, so backends, frontends. So for the Puppet code, we deploy it directly to the development environment after making some tests around it. So basically, a uh, sysadmin just push the code up, it's deployed to the dev environment, and you can check on Foreman if the changes apply. Are some of you using Puppet, maybe? No, so Puppet is a tool that will just uh, help you to configure your servers, and you can tell, I want that package installed, and you can tell, uh, put the configuration files inside it, and etc. So we use uh, the, we write down our infrastructure like it was PHP code, basically. That means that we can change the infrastructure using Git and things like that. And then it's really easy after to have an overview of your environment because everything is in that there's five uh, puppet files and it's a code. So you can easily grab it, find it, and etc. And then when the puppet code is deployed to the development environment, you can say, okay, I want it to be applied to the UAT and to production. So if you, for example, if you want to install a solar server on a, serv on a server called Media Salsa 03, for example, you can write it down to the puppet code and then it's installed automatically in the development environment. Then you can click a button and have the same uh, solar setup on the UAT environment, and you click another button and you have the same on the production environment. And then all the environments are not really the same. Some one, sometimes you just want, for example, the replication be activated on a certain, on, uh, on the development environment, so you can add feature flags in your puppet code, so you can say, okay, on that environment, I uh, want to test that things, and you can still play with the, the rest of the puppet code to the other environments. And then we have the application code, so the developers just, they do their magic code, oh sorry. And then they can, they receive a mail and basically they can just click a button to have it deployed to UAT if everything works and then the business can, the business decision is, okay, it works on UAT, do we put it directly on production, do we click the button to put it on production so the customers can have the new features? But for the, for the developers, it's like, okay, I push, I can, I have the integration test in the development environment, and then I can just uh, push it to UAT by myself. So the tests, yeah, the developers, they test a lot. But, yeah, before the test didn't work, or it works on their machine because they have their PHP version, which is not the same as in production, or is the wrong platform because they are using Ubuntu and we are using CentOS in production, or it's not the good PHP version, yeah. But now it's fixed thanks to Jenkins and also thanks to Vagrant. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Vagrant, but Vagrant allows you to create a test environments, for example, in VirtualBox. So if you want a CentOS 5 to test something, you can just have it and destroy it, rebuild it, and things like that. So, and Jenkins run the test on the development environment, which is the same as the production environment. So if the test works on the development environment, they will work on production, and you do not affect production by running all these tests that, that are already working on the same environment, except that it's testing environment. 
And then the code is under review and control. I think nowadays everyone does it, everyone do it. But yeah, it's what I think, but I have already met people which are just, okay, no, it's not under revision control, and uh, you need to, uh, SSH, oh, no, no, just use Git or anyone you want, Mercurial. Or, and then you need to prefer the small commits bec before, because if you want to, if you have a performance issue and you need to review 50, uh, 50 commits or one big commit, it's like, Okay, yeah, uh, maybe we prefer to have small changes one after an another. And if I really want to have uh, a new feature or a new version of my application, then I will probably make a second Git repository. And I will probably, for example, uh, make a, a new repository for the version four of my program instead of having another branch. And we are just packaging the master branch, so the developers yeah, they can work on their own branches, but we are just using the the master branch on Jenkins. And after that, if you really, really need to have several versions, you have several projects, you have several you have several other things like that. And then with the the Git stuff, we just put it in a package. So all the code is on an operating system package. Uh, some people just don't catch why, so that's why we use uh, operating system packaging system like uh, Debian, RPMs, and things like that. So it is important because it brings you all the features of the uh, packaging system of the operating system. For example, uh, if you have dependency to our project and you don't have packages, you will probably need to add the shell script to it to install all the dependencies and things like that. And when you are a file on your server, so where is that PHP file coming from? You can just know it just by looking at the OS uh, provided tools. And the source repository may not be reachable, yeah. To clone a Git repository, you need uh, a SSH key or password, and you need maybe to be connected to a VPN. So the source repository might not be reachable as it's really easy to build a uh, repository or uh, operating system repositories like with Pulp or with uh, Debian create rep uh, repo stuff and things like that. It becomes really easy. And when you automate, when you use Puppet, when you use Chef, when you use Ansible, and any, any other uh, automation tool, it's really a little of a way to add this to your uh, automation. It's easy to add a package that a Git repository in R, no. It's just uh, easy to use the packaging system and you have tools like FPM that can just do it for you. And then there is one important thing that the configuration does not belong to a package. Yeah, so you can build packages but do it the right way, I mean, if you put the MySQL configuration to the package and you want to use the same package on each environment, it's gon not gonna work unless you have the same uh, password on each environment, but basically the IP will change. So just separate the code and the configuration. And then we use Jenkins. So Jenkins is the software that will just uh, check out the code and do the test and things like that. So it's the main, I w it's the main piece of software that we are using on an everyday basis. So Jenkins uses pipelines. So a pipeline is a collection of jobs. So a job is, for example, one test, package, checkout. I will explain that further. But, and they just run one after another. So. First, I check out. If it succeeds, I will uh, one style check. If it succeeds, if it succeeds, and then you have all a beautiful pipeline, and you can see where, where it's wrong. So it, is it the tests that are failing? Is it the packaging that fails? And for the developers, it's really easy because they push their code, and then Jenkins makes some magic, and they get a mail back with the changes they made and the link to deploy it. So 
The deployment is also made inside Jenkins, so there is one tool that does a lot of different things using different known tools like Drush and etc. But the developers, they push, they get the mail, it was okay, it was not okay, that's the reason why, and that's the change log, so you know also who to blame or who. You don't need to point fingers, but if you know, okay, that guy just make a changes, he will push it maybe to UAT, and then you, you know if you break it, you know it's, oh, it's really my code that breaks it, and I need to, to correct it before I can, it can go to development or UAT environment. And so our pipelines are puppetized. That means that they are automated. So we do not go to the uh, Jenkins web interface to click 40 buttons to have a new job and to type everything by hand. So each pipeline is identical to another pipeline. For example, the backend pipeline, yeah. We have several backends, one for version, version 3, version 3.5. Yeah, it's just the same. It's just the same pipeline. That does not mean that it's the same code because we specified the Git repository, for example. We specified uh, the dashboard view we want in Jenkins. For those who use Jenkins, we directly put the pipelines in the right view. And then we also add the target URLs. That, that is used for testing, so for testing and for doers. So, uh, before, yeah, we went to the server, we went to us by hand, like to us update, to us clean cache. But now we just use the pipelines and the M collective stuff to do it. And we do not have manual work uh, to do. So if you need to do the clean cache on four several servers, yeah, it's not going to do it. And then we also create the views using Puppet. So from the installation to, of Jenkins to the creation of the pipelines, everything is automated. So what is a pipeline in a graphical way? That's a pipeline. So uh, you have all the jobs that are run one after another, and you also have the history of the pipeline. So that's the last three pipelines. You can see that uh, this one, jo this job has just failed. Um, it's, this job has just failed, for example. And then it's really easy to, to see, okay, that was wrong, that was good, and it's always the same testing that is made. So what, are, what do we have in the pipeline? We have first the checkout. So a developer pushed the code, we just pull it. Then we have the syntax check. We just use php-l. It's fast, it's easy, and it can just tell quickly if something is wrong. You do not have to deploy a package and things like that. If there is really a huge mistake, you see it directly. Then we do the style check using Drupal Coder. I don't know if some of you are using it, but it's using PHP Code Sniffer. And you can do, just plug it in. You have uh, the Drupal style guide stuff. And Jenkins allows you to have some graphics to see, OK, I added like. 10 new warnings in my code, and okay, I fixed 10 new warnings. Then we do the package. Uh, the place when, where we do it is really important because we package it before we test it. That's important because we will use the final packet during the test, which means that, okay, maybe the development environment will be broken because there is a mistake in the code, but at least we know that if the test succeed, we will have exactly the same code in production. There will no be path changes, there will no be fancy stuff, no. It will be the same code. And then we deploy it to the development environment. So basically we use Pulp, I don't know if someone, you, you, I know, we do not use Pulp for that. We use Pulp for the Puppet packages, which just create our APM repositories easily. And for the code, we use Debian files because we have nodes running Debian. And then we deploy them using mcollective. So mcollective allows you to remotely deploy uh, update packages doing the APT, uh, APT update and things like that. And then you can uh, we run the test in the development environment. So basically, first we do a reinstall of 
the website, for example, we do a fresh rush sheet install just to make sure that we didn't break it, the installation. And then we just go on with the test. It's rush one test. I do not know what's behind, to be honest, because I'm not a developer, but yeah, rush one test, and we only pick uh, the test related to our code because, yeah, the Drupal test takes like two or three hours, and we do not modify the Drupal core code. We just modify the Meja Moza modules. And then we publish the package to the other environments, which means that instead of using branches like one branch for the development, one branch for the production environment, we just use several uh, repositories. So for example, in the development repository, you will have version 45, but in the production one, you will have version 25. And that's why we don't use uh, Git branches because we use it, we use the system packages and we just do it another way. And then the developers, the operators, any, anyone can run the promotions, which mean, okay, that package is good. Let's put it in production. Let's put it in UAT. So at the end of the pipeline, you just have that page. You receive it. You receive the link uh, by mail. And then you have a button. Then you, you can just deploy the demo front end to UAT. Up, click the button. You, can, you want to deploy it to production? OK, click another button. You want to deploy it to academical production? Yeah, there is a third button. So it's really simple. The developers doesn't need to learn to you, how to use Jenkins, how to, how to SSH to a server, how to do Dwarf DB with their good parameters. No, it's just one button. It's really simple. And you can also add some more coding conditions to the promotions. Like, OK, you can promote it to UAT. Uh, you can promote it to the production one, yeah, but only if you have promoted it to the UAT first. So you can ensure that the version on production will not be behind UAT. There cannot be human mistake there. It's kind of dependency between the version of production UAT and things like that. The other side is that someone, sometimes you just deploy it to UAT and UAT again and UAT again, and you forget to update the production one, and your production one is one month behind, but that's still something we need to figure out. So Jenkins used a lot of different tools, like uh, Pulp to manage the RPM repositories and M Collective to update the packages and to run Drush. But that's completely transparent for the end user. If you are using M Collective already, I have on my GitHub page uh, a Drush agent for uh, M Collective, which can do the basic stuff like update DB and basically, uh, basically clean, cleaning the, co the caches. And M Collective is important here because you probably don't want to Jenkins to be able to SSH the production machines, the InfoDev machines, and the UAT machines. M Collective is uh, limited of what it can or cannot do, and there is authentication there, and you do not need to access full SSH access to your uh, to all your different servers. So that was the automation part. Now let's go to the third part, the measurements. So in the DevOps, uh, in the DevOps IDs, you try to monitor everything. You try to have a lot of metrics from any kind of stuff. And it's important because, yeah, it's, it's not when it has crashed that you will find the metrics from one hour ago. No, you need to have every everything at no to be sure that when it will crash, you will have the right things. So you create the more metrics you can, and then you can you see, okay, that one is really useless, or that one is not useful in this case, but yeah, the goal is to have the more relevant stuff inside your monitoring tools. So the first thing, not the first thing, but one thing we do is we use Logstash. I don't know if some of you use Logstash, but it's a small uh, application 
that will just collect the logs, the Drupal logs, the Apache logs, the development logs, the system logs, and then you can just take take them from different sources. Like for example, you, then you can take it from the Drupal watchdog, you can take it from syslog, from uh, and any kind of stuff, and then you can export it to whatever you want. So if you want to put it into Graphite, I don't know if some of you are using Graphite, but Graphite basically helps you to create great, uh, metrics in a really easy way. For example, uh, you can just open a socket to port 200 and 200, uh, 2222 and send something there and it will be a metric in your graph, you don't have any configuration to do to add a new metrics and every developer can basically do it. And Logstash can do it for you. For example, when I have a fifth, uh, 500 error in Apache, I just create a metric for, for that and say, okay, there is, uh, there is a 500 error there. And then you can just graph it, have, okay, how much error do I have? And you can say, okay, at the same time, I had the load that went up and I have uh, the FFmpeg usage that went up, and that's, that helps you to find what caused the troubles. You can also do it with the deployment logs. For example, you are deploying a new version, and you probably want to show the management, okay, we have developed 10 new versions today, we have deployed 10 new versions today, so we are really, uh, we are working fluently, and everything works like expected, and you can tell your customers, okay, we have Develop, we have pushed five new features in production last month, and it's it. Right. And you also have the system logs, that's more f not for developers, but developers can also just see, okay, that's the load average, that's, and they, they start to think like operating people, because they do not go, they do not need to assess the server to see the load average, so, if their tests are just making more load average and before they can say, okay, I will try to find what, what's the problem there in my code. And they start learning with you and it's all going on. And we also log stash, elastic search, which allows you to search the logs and things like that. Kibana, which is a front end uh, to uh, elastic, elastic search and log stash, which you can just show to your developers and they can uh, just say, okay, I can easily grab all the logs from all the platforms or all the environments, so I can grab the logs of all the transcoding servers and it's easy, you can take graph out of it and things like that. You have also StatsD and Graphite, which as tools I just explained. So what do you want to monitor? Like I said, you want to monitor everything. And I mean, yeah, the basics, uh, the load average, the number of user of user connected to the machine, is Apache running, is NTP running, is the my the MySQL running, and then you want to go further. You want to monitor each vhost because yeah, maybe maybe the main the default vhost is fine, but there is one vhost with. A uh, database connection trouble, or there is a VOS that just is a, a white page of the dev. Or, and the, you want to monitor the databases too. Can the user connect to the database? Uh, isn't the database running out of space and things like that? And you also want to monitor the cron jobs. In the case of media, Mosaic is still more important because I think we are running the cron job every one or two minutes, if I do remember correctly. But if the cron job are taking too too much time or if they are not running, we really get into trouble. So we, you want that to be in your monitoring system. You don't want to go to each backend and check, okay, when did the last cron job run? No, you want to have it uh, on the same place. So for example, in Ikingar or in uh, Graphite. And then we use Graphite it, and G dash, so G dash, allows you to build dashboards uh, with the Graphite tools. So Graphite, basically it takes matrix out of a UDP uh, prod and then it just make graphics from it. So we have graphics for the basic uh, stuff like the load average, the number of users, the disk space, 
the describes the I.O. and we have more specific graphics like the FFmpeg usage. We we needed them because yeah, FFmpegs were squashing because uh, there is no enough memory in the machine. And then you build graphics, you you build da dashboards, and the next time you can just say, okay, that's the problem. No, how do I fix it and things like that? So that's some examples of FFmpeg uh, memory usage. So you can see, okay, that cr that customer just transcoded five videos or one huge, and you can start also knowing who is using your infrastructure, when they are using your infrastructure, and do you have 10 times more videos this month than last month, and yeah, you can just learn from your own infrastructure. You can extract business value out of it. That's another uh, graph of the number of managed assets. So it's the number of video, photograph, and things like that on one day. And you can, this is like, this is business valuable. You can show you, man the manager can see, okay, we have so much video, we have so much uh, photograph, and it's, it's important also for you because you can see, okay, I expect th that customer to add, for example, uh, 500 more video next month because they did it this month, and you can have the evolution of your platform. One of the difference between Graphite and Munin is that in Graphite you can specify the, range, the time range. Uh, I know in Munin it might be possible with Munin 2.0, but in Graphite it's building, it's really easy to do. You can say, I want from Monday to Tuesday or from Monday at noon to mo to Tuesday at noon and you can start doing a transformation on your graphics you can do the average you can do the sum you can you can play with all the the matrix if you want that's a third graph uh, showing the number of backend ID so it's basically the number of customers and it's also business valuable to have it uh, easily at the, under the hand. Because, yeah, you can think, yeah, but who cares about it? Sorry, you don't see it correctly, but who cares about that? Yeah, it's really important to know your infrastructure. If you do not know it, if you do not know, okay, how many people are using it, and yeah, it's like, it's useless to do monitoring, it's useless, it's like, doing monitoring and being just blind or, yeah. So it's important to have uh, all sorts of different uh, metrics. So that's, and the last point of the DevOps things is the sharing. So yeah, we just shared our experience. So if you have any questions, you can just go to the microphone and ask me them. No questions? Okay. Thank you. Oh. Hey, uh, nice presentation. It's, it's really great that you share your experience. And it seems that uh, this, uh, yeah, uh, the whole this stuff works for you. And uh, I'm curious, uh, uh, approximately how much time uh, uh, will take for a new company to adopt this way of working? Uh, do you have some? So we have been working on it for one year, but if you have already uh, a team on place and with a lot of people, it takes really a long time. It's not a one day or one month yeah. change. For example, uh, I think at Etsy, they just took like uh, 18 months to just go to a DevOps way. So you need to change the way people think about it. And you can just, it's not code, it's not something you would just say, okay, no, you do it like that. Because people will just say, no, I won't. No, you need to show them that it's better for them and that by doing it, you have more fun. You enjoy your work and you have less risk. If you deploy 10 times a day, yeah, 
then you are not afraid of deploying. Yeah. If you deploy two times a year, it's like, each time it's like, will it work, will it work? Yeah, yeah. So it's just take time because you need to change the way people think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's about the way of people thinking because this, uh, uh, this package deployment, uh, it's very interesting. I think for the company which are like uh, site factories, because it seems to be very uh, specific, uh, like uh, you should uh, host yourself because uh, this uh, package system, uh, it, it won't work with uh, all the hostings. It it's, uh, depends from the environment, from the operating system, from, from everything. Could you recommend this for the such kind of uh, companies? Yeah, actually for the front ends, we don't have one uh, one code base, we use front ends with site builder, or use custom other custom front ends, and you just need to change, for example, the tests that are running or the target platform. But as we have the pipeline puppetized, it really takes a, a really a little time to change to change it and to to just to say, okay, I have a new customer, he needs a site builder site or he needs a classic. To our site, and it's really easy for us to just create it. And so, yeah, I would recommend it for every company. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.